Koji Rose, and today we're going to be talking about the modern counter-enlightenment. This is a concept, a phrase that is scattered throughout O.G. Rose. And the argument is that there was a line of thought that you can find in the 20th century, which was basically overlooked. I'm not saying nobody knows about it. I'm not saying that nobody has read these books, but I am saying that I think it has not played a prominent role in our thinking at all. If you were to ask the average person what are the big movements of the last few centuries, they would probably say things like modernism, postmodernism, maybe they'll say phrases like romanticism, Victorianism, industrial revolution, um, things like that. And today, a, a growing phrase is the term metamodern, and that means many things. Mr. Greg Dimber does tremendous work on metamodernity in cultural studies which has a different flavor than metamodernity you find on the, the liminal web. And one would have to go into that debate. But anyway, uh, these are phrases and categories we tend to hear. But a category we don't tend to hear as much is what I want to call the modern counter-enlightenment. That is not a phrase that is used. Now, it is based on the counter-enlightenment, which the great Isaiah Berlin talks about, which I think can be associated with the Scottish Enlightenment. And there is a growing interest in those two movements and fields. But I would not say that either, even those which are more well-known are well-known uh, <laughs> as much as, say, modernism or the Enlightenment. Now. The critical point that has to be made is that the modern counter-enlightenment is not the same as post-modernity. And in fact, I would actually associate some of the modern counter-enlightenment that I'm talking about with some of the new angles emerging in meta-modernity. Uh, but it, of course, we would have to, uh, we'd have to explain what we mean by that. Such as could be highlighted by the work of Lehman Pascal in his Metaphysics of Adjacency, which I found magnificent, or is highlighted in Alex Ebert's paper, The Sublation of Mathematics, based on Hegel's Science of Logic. And ultimately, I will argue that the modern counter-enlightenment finds, um, finds a great uh, representative of its thought in The Science of Logic by Hegel. And I'm increasingly convinced that the return to Hegel we say, see today, say in Zizek, is a kind of return to this modern counter-enlightenment that we overlooked. And indeed, the meta-modernity, as understood by Greg Dimber, with a real emphasis on the oscillation. I would associate that oscillation with the dialectic, once we understand that the dialectic Hegel talks about is not a synthesis, but is, indeed, but is instead a description of a very ontological instability that can be found in all phenomena. And that ontological instability I would represent with the formula A equals B versus A is A. And here we can start to, to make our exposition on what exactly the modern counter-enlightenment is. Thinkers of the modern counter-enlightenment I would associate with people like Marcel, uh, Maurice Blondel, uh, Alfred Korobosky, Benjamin Fondane, Plavel Florensky, Peter Geetz, Alfred Whitehead, Henry Bergson, Michael Planier, René Janon, and others. And um, I don't mean to say this is all the thinkers there are. There are many others, uh, but these thinkers would be some I would put out as being examples of the modern, um, the, uh, the modern counter enlightenment. Uh, Fran Francisco Laurel would be another example. Um, and indeed, I think Isaiah Berlin was kind of aware of these different strands of, of thought. Now, the main thing that is going to characterize the modern counter-enlightenment is a critique of A is A, the Aristotelian principle of identity, a very targeted critique of that principle that is not merely a deconstruction, but a negation sublation into what I call A-B thinking. Now, that is the key difference between post-modernity and the modern counter-enlightenment. Post-modernity um, critiques autonomous rationality, autonomous identity, A is A thinking, and the Enlightenment project, but it tends to stay in the deconstruction. It doesn't negate sublate, and that's the main difference. Now, I definitely think you find overlap between postmodernity and the modern counter-Enlightenment, and in fact, I think the best parts of postmodernity can also be found in the modern counter-Enlightenment. But generally speaking, Postmodernity is in the business of deconstructing A as A, 
where the modern counter alignment is in the business of negating sublating A is A into AB. Now, once you do that, you've opened the floodgates and you have to completely reconstitute your ontoepistemology and therefore what is AB thinking is very, very complex. Um, and we have to go into the details of that and ultimately I think it's the science of logic, which I'm increasingly convinced might be the most overlooked book in the history of philosophy. And I know that sounds bizarre um, because hasn't everyone read The Science of Logic? And I'm, I'm not so sure. Now, I'm also starting to wonder if the only way to understand it is with the resources of the internet, with, um, with developments in mathematics and psychoanalysis that Hegel was before. So there might be very good reason that The Science of Logic has been overlooked. And ironically, many of these thinkers, such as Fondaine in the counter-modern enlightenment, despise Hegel because they view him as totalizing and kind of that Marxist take on Hegel. And one of the great ironies might be that the modern counter enlightenment finds some of its most powerful representations in Hegel. So for me, there's a good chance that the science of logic is completely overlooked and that all of this is a return to the modern counter enlightenment. Now, before I continue, I will note that there are many thinkers who I adore, like um, Ivan Illich, Susan Sontang, Philip Reef, Marshall McLuhan, who I'm not so sure if they're modern counter enlightenments, counter counter enlightenment thinkers, as opposed to post modernists who understand problems with autonomous rationality, and also the fact that rationality is always informed by a context, and this would always get also get you into like Foucault, um, the 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 Frankfurt School, and things like that. You know, all of the notions of ideology, all of that. There, there is a whole lot of thinkers that understand that autonomous rationality is not possible, that rationality cannot be its own grounding, and therefore um, you can't have a pure A as A identity. You know, Paul Virilio, I adore. Paul F Firebend, I adore. Charles W. Mills, I adore. Um, but I'm not sure if we can find in these thinkers a very targeted critique on A as A. And that's the main factor of the, the modern counter enlightenment, a really targeted critique on the principle of identity. Paul Virilio, Firebond who wrote Against Method, Charles W. Mills, Black, um, Blackness Visible, all of these are thinkers who really understand that ideology, systems, A is A, all of these, th you know, all of those, A is A can't be its own foundation. And thinking is, um, is much more messy, much less systematic than we realize. And there are technological factors that inform our rationality, and this is a Heideggerian point that people don't appreciate. All these thinkers get it, but I, I, I feel as if they need to be associated with postmodernity, because though they deconstruct autonomous rationality, they do not sublate it into dialectical thinking. Adorno, Foucault, Derrida, Marcuse, um, all of these indeed deconstruct A as A. And I think Deleuze is interesting, and he might be unique, because um, he, he kind of argues for an autonomous or essential difference um, versus an autonomous or essential unity. You know, that would be A as A. And so Deleuze almost provides a metaphysics of A as A, B as B, C as C, D as D, E as E, where there are many autonomous um, differences, but that is I think the logical end of postmodernity and postmodern metaphysics. I don't think it constitutes um, the modern counter enlightenment, and I believe Zizek understands this point. And I would have to make the argument. Um, I think Deleuze ends up here because he he critiques epistemologies of representation, and he doesn't want to use epistemologies of representation. Um, which to move into A B, you you do have to re. Um, you have to reincorporate representation, just not in the same way. Now, I think a key characteristic of the counter enlightenment and the Scottish enlightenment. So, you know, following Isaiah Berlin, you know, you have thinkers like Harman, who wants to really be arguing that rationality is always bound to tradition. Um, that, and also someone like uh, jo Joseph Marie, who's going to be critiquing some of the scientific visions to show that if you look at nature, you can't get moral values from that. Uh, so moral values and stuff like that ultimately have to be derived from something that is not empirical, right? Uh, and, and, and often A is A identity is a principle of metaphysics 
that is deeply tied to um, how people define empiricism and science. Those things go together. The dream of autonomous rationality uh, is the notion that um, the, the very ways to ground rationality are given by the world. They don't have to be arrived at by metaphysical consideration. And so many of the thinkers of the Count and Enlightenment are going to be like, you cannot do that. And Isaiah Berlin goes through them quite well. Um, one of the great geniuses, and arguably perhaps the father of all of this counter enlightenment thinker, in, in, is uh, Vico. Uh, he wrote, you know, his uh, the New Science, who really argues that we need to study things that man makes as opposed to science, because you know science is only knowable, but ultimately by the man of God. And Vico um, deserves a very extensive analysis. Um, I'm, I'm always quite taken by Vico, and he, he seems very important. And uh, so between Hegel and Vico, uh, you sort of see some of the foundations of this new thought uh, that comes up through Hartman, the counter, and then obviously the Scots, who are going to be emphasizing uh, common life in a David Hume, Hutchinson, Smith, who are really going to be arguing that the foundations of uh, philosophy are found, say, in sentiment, in interaction with immediacy, that, you can't, that philosophy is never... Um, divisible from from common life. And I think with that, you start to also see phenomenology, a deep analysis of experience and how phenomenology overlaps here. All of these. Um, and then that would put, if you take seriously the Scottish Enlightenment, you're going to have economics. So phenomenology, economics, sociology, arguably anthropology, and then literature as a description of all these things when done well, and the arts in general, all of these are kind of the material of the counter-enlightenment. And in the modern counter-enlightenment, which this leads into, you are going to see a critique of the very foundation of A is A, of, out of which the enlightenment arises, and then out of which modernity arises, which can be defined as totalizing narratives, and then post-modernity is a reaction to that, realizing that's problematic, but not necessarily having the ontological or epistemolo epistemological resources to negate sublate A is A into A, B, and so it becomes reactionary, and no, you know, I, I love myself, you know, I love... Uh, into the Funhouse, Barfs, um, Derrida, I think, is very important, um, and I can keep going. You know, these are very important thinkers. Uh, but we must make a distinction between postmodernity and the modern counter enlightenment uh, if we are to see why there are resources in the history of thought that might be extremely useful for dealing with our current historical moment, of which I do think entails a return to, um, to Hegel. You know, there's also the field of psychoanalysis, which is particularly interesting here because Lacan, Zapancha, Dolder, you know, these, these different thinkers, uh, Freud, you know, they understand the impossibility of autonomous rationality and they seem to suggest uh, the need for a rationality which is founded by non-rationality. Um, and so they have a sense of this problem. And this is where I think Zizek is so interesting, because I would definitely associate less than nothing with the, mo the modern counter-enlightenment. And in here you see a return to Hegel mixed with psychoanalysis and an emphasis on the science of logic. Um, now, one could say Zizek misinterpreted Hegel, but you know, I, I always like Harold Bloom on talking about how the history of thought is often pioneered by strong misreading. So regardless of what one thinks of Zizek's interpretation, I think it is utterly invaluable and I have a deep respect for him. Um, I think it's very important not to see in Zizek pure postmodernity. I do think his cultural studies his politics, stuff like that, there's a, certainly a postmodern flavor. And so there is a postmodern Zizek. But I also think, um, well, especially when you get to his work on Hegel, that there is a modern counter enlightenment that is at work there. Now, I also want to stress, I'm not saying that the, the modern counter enlightenment is the best philosophy or necessarily my favorites. Uh, but I do think we need to identify this unique strand of thought that has been overlooked. Um, Blondel, in his book Action, for example, wants to emphasize that philosophy independent of action that's based on identity is very problematic because you don't get a stable identity. It is always in the context of a action. Um, you could associate this perhaps with the relations of a whitehead, but there's an emphasis on action in Blondel. Uh, Korobowski, in his book on the science of sanity, really, you know, he, he, he understands how A is A is very bad for mental health because we don't live or think according to um, a stable identity. Um, in, in, in fact, 
um, identity is always moving and becoming, as we see in Hegel. And there's a lot more to Korobosky. He's, he's quite impressive. Um, Fondane, Benjamin Fondane in Existential Monday, as I read with John in Davout. I didn't know about him, and now I do. And it's very clear that he sees, you know, he's going to defend what he calls irrationality, and I want to call it non-rationality. And he understands that without irrationality, rationality becomes totalizing and utterly destructive. And it leads to a society, a world of war, or boredom, and you could say everything being turned into standing reserve, as to mention Heidegger. And Heidegger certainly has parts of him that overlay with the modern counter enlightenment. Um, Fondane, though, is an example of someone who ironically despises Hegel, which, again, if most people understand Hegel through Marx, that's understandable, but he would be an example of a modern counter enlightenment thinker. Um, and that, that also with uh, Laurel, who wants to talk about who I didn't know about, but he warns that philosophy requires non-philosophy to operate, and it usually just kind of skips over the step of assenting to a non-philosophy by which it organizes itself, very similar to the thinking I put forth on non-rationality. Um, and I think Laurel's thinking, the more I study it, seems extremely relevant here. Um, Pavel Florensky, that uh, Treya Telesbrand has brought my attention, ha is absolutely a critique of self-relating identity and sees it as leading to isolated individualism and, uh, and, autonomous, um, and, and autonomous living, which is self-destructive and bad for the soul. Uh, and he's a Christian thinker that wants to really align identity with the Trinity. Peter, Peter Geetz, which is the husband of um, of Anscom was also basically believed as a had destroyed thought, and uh, it makes that argument. Uh, Michel Planier, who wrote P Personal Knowledge, that's another example of a thinker who's in on this. Rene Janon, who emphasizes quality over quantity, is another example. And then you have Whitehead and Bergson, both of whom are very concerned on Einstein's uh, block universe and understanding of time being defined outside of subjective experiences of time. Whitehead's going to be talking about the prevalence of relations, how identity cannot be understood outside of relation. Um, Henry Bergson's entire conception of creative evolution and time also aligned with this. Um, I claim no expert, no, I claim no radical expertise in any of these thinkers. Uh, Whitehead and Bergson, the gentleman, um, notes, uh, footnotes to Plato, his, his YouTube page is extremely impressive. Um, and, and indeed, I believe Mr. Bard will be putting forth a book soon that incorporates much of Whitehead and Bergson. Um, my impression of all of these thinkers, though, is that there is indeed a targeted critique of ontological and epistemological foundations based on self-relating identity, or A is A thinking. These thinkers are not postmodernists. Certainly, they have postmodern elements, but they are not postmodernists. Um, many in the metamodern movement today are claiming these thinkers, and I think there's validity to that because indeed some, there is something about metamodernity in emphasizing the oscillation that is a return to the dialectic, which is a return to Hegel without realizing it. And indeed, the critique of A as A, I've been convinced, is, found, is founded and followed through in the science of logic. Um, but I don't think these thinkers... Uh, but but I don't think we should assume that these thinkers are just expressions of metamodernity and in fact came before metamodernity as we understand it now, which is emerging out of the oscillation between modernity and postmodernity. These are thinkers of whom understood that there was a problem with A is A and their philosophy and thinking is based on that. And I think as recently um, I put out that audio summary on fiction is the mathematics of the humanity. I think great literature is also an expression and quote unquote proof of the problems of A is A thinking um, and shows that we need to return to the, the modern counter enlightenment that I think we have overlooked and not even named. There are other thinkers who are magnificent. I'm just not sure if I can place them in the modern counter enlightenment such as um, Austin Farah, uh, as an example of a great mind, he wrote a book called The Finite and the Infinite that seems magnificent. He definitely seems to align with the modern counter-enlightenment. Um, Hannah Ardent in The Life of the Mind also seems to ho have overlap, but I'm not sure. And I have not meant at all to provide an exhaustive list of thinkers uh, who, who belong to the modern counter-enlightenment. The Kyoto School seems, seems like it, it has a lot of overlap, the, the African philosophers. Uh, Nietzsche seems like he has overlap with it. Um, and, and so, please do not 
have me saying that this is, you know, this is, this is, this is the group. The main thing I have attempted to do or wanted to do is draw attention to a line of thinking that I don't believe has been named or um, focused on. And I think they've been blurred with postmodernists or modernists or just overlooked. And I think they've been overlooked because if you take seriously their critique of ASA, well, everything changes. You know, you can't have these hard categories dividing, say, science and literature. Um, you can't have stable identities and everything becomes much more existential and complex and difficult. And frankly, it leads to Hegel and Hegel's heart. And it's also, I mean, during modernity, we didn't, most of moder modernity and post-modernity did not have a deep understanding of, say, quantum logic or quantum gravity or all these new movements in science. So the idea, so science seemed to be telling people that, that A is A was the right direction, right? And so it is understandable that any thinkers who oppose to that seem crazy, huh? You know, they seem kind of, they seem kind of crazy. It, it's an understandable feeling. Also, we didn't have, say, game theory with Nash equilibrium to show that when all actors are rational, you get a suboptimal result. We, we did not have um, computation powers by which to sim simulate um, certain experiments to give us reason to think that a stable universal model or block universe, as Einstein talks about, uh, could, could be not wrong, but incomplete. So it is understandable why the modern counter-enlightenment was overlooked. And then after it's overlooked, it's understandable that we tend to read it through post-modernity because that's our reference point. That's what we know. And we tend to read everything through our current moment. It's just natural to do that. So it is understandable where the thinking was overlooked and not named and blurred with other categories. But uh, I think it is time to make this distinction. And I think a lot of what Lehman Pascal and his metaphysics of adjacency, which I've come to love and learn about, is also pointing to what exactly are the implications of a critique of A is A. Uh, what, do you, what happens if 99% is the new 100%, as he puts it? And hopefully the paper uh, might, might explain that, in the, might explain that and, and get into that. Um, I also think it is important to make this distinction because often postmodernity can be associated with kind of comedy, joking, um, non-seriousness, irony, and, and, and not taken seriously. And so if we associate um, modern counter-enlightenment thinkers with postmodernity, there's a sense of not taking them seriously. And I think that's happened with Zizek unfairly because less than nothing is extraordinary. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's another reason. We don't want... A, B thinking to be seen as like a joke or silly or absurd. And a lot of, and if it's too closely aligned with postmodernity, that, that can occur. Now again, metamodern thinkers who stress complexity theory, emergence, so on and so forth, and it always depends on what you mean by that, game B, dark renaissance, I think these thinkers all understand uh, the incompleteness of A is A. Uh, I think they are making advancements in this area that, that that for me, one of the reasons the point to the modern counter enlightenment is to show there's actually a tradition of this thinking that say these thinkers today, uh, dark renaissance, so on and so forth, that are critiquing self-relating identity, A is A to something more complex, say following a Whitehead or a Bergson. I think it's important to see that there's a tradition because a tradition is all proof, evidence, that this move in philosophy today and thinking today is valid, that it is not out of the blue, that it is not, um, that it has no precedent, that there is a history for it, that it has been developing and, and coming forth. Um, and, and, and I think that's important because the, when you have a tradition to back it or that it can fit into or see itself in light of, that will make it all the stronger and I think help provide substance and sustainability to that movement. And also, I think it all suggests why returning to Hegel today is valid, and also returning to Hume and the Scottish Enlightenment, um, and taking seriously the role of, say, non-rationality uh, in the development of thought, or what Laurel calls non-philosophy, or Hume calls tradition. And there's also a, a, a strand of this thought that goes into thinkers like Burke, um, Tocqueville, thinkers like that, and, and all of them basically are just saying that thought cannot be its own grounding. Uh, for me, that means ultimately we'll get into the topic of common life and how common life has to be a foundation for thought so that it does not, um, so that thinking does not become autonomous. And I think if you take seriously the negation of being and nothing that Hegel opens the science of logic with, then that means the foundation for thinking has to be common life, phenomenology, the historic moment, the positioning of the subject. And indeed, that is 
the positionality of the modern counter enlightenment of which I think it's time for us to pay attention to and study and to incorporate into our work today. For more by O.G. Rose, please see YouTube, Instagram, Medium, Substack, Twitter, all these things. And thank you so much for your time.